to be tough and keep them all for 15 minutes so that we will have time for discussion later. So we'll start without more ado, and I have very much pleasure in asking you, Tommy and Parney, to go first. Tommy. Thank you, Mary, for that introduction, and thank you for the introduction to republicanism in general. And I would also like to thank the Communist Party of Ireland for providing us with this opportunity, which, as Mary has said, is an excellent chance and very necessary and very important that we do so. And I, I view this as a discussion rather than a debate. And I think it's to advance our, our understanding rather than to be in a, a situation of conflict. As such, what I would like to do is give you my understanding of the classical take on republicanism, to which Mary has uh, very eloquently alluded, to then to look at perhaps Irish republicanism or how republicanism has impacted and been interpreted and acted out here in Ireland, and then to look at uh, contemporary republicanism. The title of the discussion today is 21st century republicanism. Is it still relevant? Will it be relevant? Can we make it relevant? I mean, I, I, I believe it, it certainly is, but it, it, it's something we have to look at. Uh, classical republicanism, when we take a look at it, it is, if you like, it's a system of government where the people is sovereign and there is no other authority recognized as superior. It doesn't accept either monarch or pope or, and very relevant to today, bank, groups of bankers or speculators. And as such, therefore, Viewing the people as sovereign is essential to republicanism, and as Barry has pointed out very correctly, the people <coughs> being sovereign, there is also, since the people are sovereign, there's this very clear understanding that from that arises that with a sovereign people there is also something that's very important, is the common good. Because if the people is sovereign, the people there logically will not uh, provide for a system of government governance that would be contrary to the common good. What then arises, obviously, is the interpretation of how to best provide for the common good for all, and there are many interpretations of that. However, because it's that fundamental tenet of republicanism, where the people is sovereign, the great struggles throughout history to reject the idea that any one individual or a very small group of individuals could sit with absolute authority over others. When that is contested, when it is accepted that that is not how we will govern humanity, therefore it has to be accepted that, as has been said, that there is a degree of individual freedom within the people. So therefore there is going to be a contention that there is no such thing as republicanism that holds good. There is no ten commandments for republicanism. If there is any commandment, it is that the people is sovereign. Beyond that, we do not have a credo such as the church has. There is no such thing as a Republican Pope. And what I would like to do there, for just to, to, to illustrate this point, every age and generation must be as free to act for itself in all cases as the age and generations which preceded it. The vanity and presumption of governing beyond the grave is the most ridiculous and insolent of all tyrannies, said Tom Paine in The Rights of Man. And when we think about that, there is um, profound implications in that. Because while it means that we are not prisoners of the past, we can certainly draw inspiration from the past. We can draw lessons from the past. But we are not bound by the past. So on that basis, the republicanism that was expounded in Greece, in Rome, that was expounded throughout continental Europe, while we may draw lessons from it, we cannot point to any one set of rules and regulations and say that these will hold good forever. So what we're saying is republicanism, as humanity and people, as society changes, therefore republicanism will also change. <coughs> republicanism has certainly changed over the millennia, across the centuries and even from decade to decade. <coughs> The Greek and Roman Republic and republics, they excluded all but the very wealthy, the most privileged. The English Republic, the English Republic excluded Catholics, and more particularly Irish Catholics. And even the French Republic, we might say very ungallantly, decided to exclude the female section of society. But all were republics. And have we therefore, 
have been looked at classical republicanism? Have we now, for example, reached this wonderful stage of nirvana because now we could say in our republic that we now have universal suffrage, that we have certainly, we certainly have given the right to people to vote. The point then is, not necessarily, because we're talking about something that changes and is ongoing. Having established and looked at what we may describe as the classical understanding of republicanism, where the people is sovereign, yet our understanding of republicanism is ongoing and subject to change, because as Tom Paine said, you cannot bind the future by an act of the present. So by its very definition, by its understanding, by one of the giants of Republican intellectualism, and dare any of us contradict that, that the future cannot be bound by the present. We then look, I would suggest, we then look to Republicanism in Ireland. Republicanism in Ireland, and I hesitate, although we often use the phrase Irish Republicanism, but because republicanism, the form of government which dictates and insists that the people is sovereign, we then, of course, can ask the question, what portion of the people, what section of the people, what element of the people, but the people being sovereign is as distinct from one individual. And the way I say republicanism is therefore a universal concept. How we have interpreted it here in Ireland is important to our understanding, not just of where we've been, but where we are today and where we are likely to go to. A very important aspect, I would argue, of republicanism is that it is functional. Republicanism isn't a life choice in the same way that we prefer a particular colour for our shirt or a particular style of music. It is not that type of life choice. People see it because it applies to people as something that is functional, something that is useful, and something that applies to the common good, to the common weal, to the common wealth. And I'm using that phrase very <coughs> carefully because it doesn't apply to how it is used today in Britain. In Ireland, and this I think is something that is very important, that it was seen, and has been seen, and I would argue should be seen into the future, as something that would provide for the common good, but something that was functional. <coughs> and I think this is very crucial to our understanding of Irish republicanism, and how Irish republicanism has changed over the centuries and over the decades. <coughs> because those that saw it as vital to their interest, useful and important, when they had achieved a certain level, when they had got a certain amount of their agenda, they then could move on or stay still. Let me say this, republicanism has a long history in this island, but the great uprising of the United Irish, the United Irish were supported by many of the wealthy middle class, by the merchants, by the business people, and particularly maybe, by the linen merchants of Antrim Down and Belfast. And many of their objections to the type of governance that they experienced prior to 1800 was because of their inability to access the empire's markets, because of restrictions on their ability to trade. And when those issues were addressed, we thereafter see a decline in support for the concept of a republic on this island from within a certain business section, who in turn, in time, were to be able to accommodate themselves very comfortably to within a monarchistic union, and in fact become the bastions of it into the last century and this century. Similarly, we have seen, and this is something that I think is very, very important when we're looking at republicanism on this side, that that agenda can change from time to time. We saw republicanism as it emerged first with the United Irishmen, and actually it was here. It was here before the United Irishmen, and this is very important. Not only it was here, and particularly in the North East, and I'll come back to that before I end because it's important. We saw republicanism 
those that were content to define republicanism almost as home rule, but were an economic system that prevailed, that was suited to them at the time of the treaty, where they were content to see republicanism interpreted as a free state and therefore to depart from the search for to develop the republic. And what I'm saying is this, that rather than get ourselves into this endless round of accusations about treachery and sellout, what we're looking at are those that find themselves in a situation of contentment, whether it's the linen merchants of Belfast or the blue shirt merchants of coming a year, that when they reach a situation of contentment, they want the situation to freeze there and then and it not to develop. And that's where the conflict, therefore, has arisen time after time after time, where those who reach a level of contentment, when Fianna Fáil, having competed against the Common Gael party in the Free State, found themselves then in government, thereafter their radicalism declines, ceases and they are content because they have achieved a level of satisfaction for their clique, their party, their group, their class that says, right, we shall now stop this bus. It's not the old anal analogy of getting off the bus, it's stop the bus. And that's what we have to think about and we have to look about because we have seen this time after time through history and it's not unusual, there's nothing <coughs> surprising about it because once one section is satisfied, it says things are satisfactory, things are well enough. So where do we go from today if we're talking about republicanism? Will it survive? Should it survive? Can it survive? Republicanism into the 21st century as the lecture has it. And yes, we have a number of tasks because if republicanism is to have any value, and it has had a value, and it is seen as a very functional, very, very important form of organization, form of government. Republicanism has addressed the needs of people throughout this island over the last two centuries, those who have not had the ability to have their needs redressed by the conventional establishment. From the time of the United Irishmen, whether they succeeded on every occasion or not is something else but their needs were being addressed right through to the most recent conflict where a republic across the island was seen by a section of the northern community as their better option in order to get out of the misery that they found themselves in through 50 or 60 years of an orange state. And we can critique it, certainly we can have our difficulties with it, but that was clearly an underlying logic. And we look at it, therefore, today. There is a serious problem on the island in terms of the common good. We don't have to elaborate on that. We're sitting in billions of debt. We have 14% unemployed. <coughs> it's running off, it's approaching. It's approaching a half a million out of work in the 26 counties. What we have in this state, in spite of their excuses. We have the option of meltdown today or if you like we could describe it as a slow puncture. But the wheels of this vehicle is going down. That is the simple fact. So we're faced with a problem of addressing the common good. And in order to address the common good we have got to look beyond what we have today. Republicanism therefore must draw, as I would suggest, on a different ideology than it has applied in the past. Republicanism changes. To a certain extent, inspiration, I think, again will come possibly, probably, <coughs> very likely from maybe the inspiration within the North. One person I'd like to quote from a town in County Armagh, which is not necessarily known at all as a hotbed of republicanism, a town called Porty Down. There are good, decent, strong-minded republicans in Porty Down, but this man was called George Gilmer, Protestant from outside Porty Down. 
And they wrote about James Connolly once for the Dublin Trades Council. And he said, there always have been and probably still are sincere and devoted <laughs> trade union workers who see the function of working class organisation as beginning and ending with the amelioration of the lot of wage earning people within the capitalist system of society. And if any of us accept the view of working class struggle, <coughs> we must, I think, dismiss, and if we accept that view, you said, we must dismiss Connolly's teachings. But if on the other hand, we believe that working class struggle for better conditions within the kind of society in which we live must be pushed ahead to the overthrow of the so social system that rests on the exploitation of the working classes, if we accept that, then we accept the relevance of Connolly's teaching. We are now in a situation where republicanism, if it's to be relevant, must look at this situation, must become functional, must give up its absolute fixation that republicanism can be confined to uniting Ireland. We have to look at changing the economic system for the better through uniting the working class. And as the United Irishmen, knowing where they come from, originally, coming from the English Republic, which had experienced, first and foremost, class division, because that's where Belfast Republicanism began, manifesting itself, of course, to the, the French Republic. They recognized that it was not enough to use the old ideas of the English Commonwealth Republic, that a new program had to be set down, where you had to bring together all elements of Irish society. It was a new departure with the United Irish Men. That again we need. We <coughs> cannot reconcile orange and green. We have to move beyond it. We cannot reconcile capitalism to a better way of life. We've got to move beyond it. And let me say this, if we're moving into the future, republicanism will neither be orange, green, or it'll not even be green, white, and orange. Republicanism, if it's to move into the future, will be red.